Nitin. I am one of GER management trainee from Law Seco, and I welcome you all in our today's session on how to guide for making a successful career in intellectual properties law. And as a subject matter expert, we have none other than Nipun Bhatia sir with us. So it's my second webinar with Nipun sir, and so. Yeah. So I think everyone by this time knows Nipun sir, but sir, if you can give a very brief introduction of yourself, that would be great. All right. So uh, yes, it's my second webinar with uh, Anubhav, and I've been regularly involved with a lot of Law Seco initiatives. I'm also the teaching faculty at uh, their law practice management course. I'm a lawyer and chartered accountant, working right now as a management consultant. uh ip is one field where i've been interested in i did my post graduation specialization in ipr from uh, isia that's uh, indian society of international law i have uh, you know my 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 first law firm job was with one of the premier um, you know ipr firm of the country that's what uh, you know strengthened my interest in the area further and since then i've been uh, i've been you even call me an ip enthusiast i've worked with almost all the ip law firms of the country i have a fair a knowledge of the subject matter as well but more on the functioning of how ipr firms function what are the challenges they are the challenges they are facing what are the nuances that are very particular to the ipr firms and of course uh, you know some bit of it which is related to the media laws as well because both the practices are quite intertwined uh, in themselves so that's what my background is of course um i've worked with the ipr firm for about 2 and a half years i was uh, handling their hr their administration their operations their enforcement team and investigations so i've been deeply entrenched in that uh, field of ipr and post when i started working as a management consultant then we have uh, i have personally uh, helped ipr firms into mergers i have uh, helped them with recruitments with setting up their structures and uh, you know mostly in in terms of uh, getting their operations in place you are such a polymath sir <laughs> so sir why don't we start with um explaining what is your drive for ip law so we know that you have done your speciali specialization in ipr from indian institute of international law you have ton of other qualifications for that matter like you are qualified ca you have bcom degree you are also a lawyer yeah uh, you have worked with almost every ip law firm in india and some foreign too so what is this love for ipr uh, if you can a bit touch upon that so those those who know my field uh, know that i do a lot of branding related work for law firms and lawyers uh, as well so whether it's with respect to branding for law firms or building personal brand for lawyers i think brands is something uh, which is uh, Uh, which has always intrigued me and a lot of brand related work is uh, in the field of ipr when you when you talk about trademarks when you talk about infringement there are interesting stories as to how uh, brand uh, brands become um, you know household names there was there was a time when people instead of stock, uh, speaking photocopy started saying isko xerox kara lo um toothpaste for the longest time was only colgate everyone used to not ask ki toothpaste everyone used to say colgate le aana koi bhi toothpaste ko kyun na lekar ke aaye so there were brands that became synonymous noodles were you know maggi became synonymous with noodles we could not think or fathom of anything else back then so there are brands and brands have a very strong power of influencing people i feel that uh, brands influence our day to day lives brands influence the way we are perceived in the market so i think the love for ip but i merely came because of my love for the branding aspect and i thought i i found it very very intriguing when i when i was reading about the trademark infringement cases i used to find it interesting and when i started working in a law firm i could see the theory turning into uh, practical aspects there were such interesting cases you know uh, something like a renowned a brand like bisleri when you go into the interiors of india where there are villages there are not very well uh, turned out towns you know people have duplicate bisleri bottles where, where even you know it it really takes a lot of effort to find out which one is uh, the correct one and which one is a forged one so you know when i saw a lot of practical uh, relevance for the ip that's when my interest kind of you know uh, i was like you know this is one field i need to be associated with great great so now we know that what are the things lovable about ip so how about we discussing the career opportunities in ip law like what are the kinds of jobs available for ip attorneys and what is the scope of growth in it 
okay so um ipr in a field it the field itself is extremely vast what happens perhaps is a lot of times uh people are not aware and they inclu- including me at one uh, up until one point of time because um in law schools there is a lot of thrust on trademarks and some bit of it in copyrights not a lot is spoken about patents not a lot is spoken about geographical indications not a lot is spoken about trade secrets so ipr is a very vast field it you know a lot of times people feel that it's restricted to trademarks copyrights and patents but the field is pretty large there is also a lot of other angles which have started coming into the field there is data protection which is intertwined as i said a media related uh, functioning is now becoming very intertwined with ipr so the field itself is very vast yeah if you're talking to me about career prospects then yeah. then there is uh, this is perhaps one area and ipr is one area where lawyers have plethora of opportunities because of the fact that it's very vast you can do your further specializations in each niche field be it trademark or copyright which is connected to media or patents or geographical indications or industrial designs also this is one field that dedicatedly has paralegal concept so if you see the functioning of ipr firms there are uh, paralegals and then there are lawyers which is something that i have not seen in lot of other firms a firm that does only corporate or that does only litigation or that does taxation may not have as popular a concept of paralegals but in uh, ipr firms paralegals are treated sometimes more um, you know with more dignity and respect than lawyers because they have a lot of practical hands on experience and you, if you see the typical working of law firms ipr firms paralegals have also started taking up law degrees and vice versa a lot of lawyers after pursuing their llb opt for the job of paralegal so there is nothing there is nothing inferior in that i feel paralegals do a lot of procedural work in ipr and which is important and this is this is one field that gives you that ready platform where you can perhaps just um, um make yourself important to the firm put your legal skills at job and you may eventually grow into the firm to even head a department there are paralegals who have gone up to head departments head trademark prosecution head oppositions so the field is such that gives you a lot of opportunities in terms of work okay so one is paralegal and other so of course there's you have to you you can be you can start the normal associate senior associate way okay. the other is the paralegal way of course if you work under uh, councils there are not many councils who are dedicated to ipr because you know uh, it is treated so far uh, if you if you look at the corporate angle of it ip becomes just one part of a very big corporate deal but then there are people who have built that expertise within corporate law so if you know that there is when there is a deal being struck when there is um, an agreement between uh, is signed and simple thing like an employer employee agreement as well there are ip clauses to it let's say if i am working as um, an employee and i develop something out of my learnings and my skill whose property is it is it my property is it my employer's property so every contract every agreement every commercial transaction has an ip angle to it so uh, you know within within that that um, particular career path you can choose to go the the normal law firm way where you are working as an associate you can work with councils who are specifically dedicated to the field of ipr you can also try and uh, explore the paralegal way and eventually get into the system of being a lawyer great great of course there are the, sorry to sorry to mention as i spoke in my previous session as well that content writing has come up in a big way there are a lot of my friends who have started uh dedicated portals for ip there is spicy ip there is ipr ment law all of these portals have been started by lawyers who had a vision for ip so if you want to get into ip content writing that's also one very uh, relevant area for you to to function in okay so is there a concept of i of counsel in ipr law when you say of counsel as in the normal counsels which people brief when they go for hearings yeah of counsel of counsel in a normal um law firm terminology is someone who opts out of the career progression path within a law firm let's say when they get into uh, the role of an associate and they grow into senior associate principal associate and eventually a partner that's one career track and when you say off counsel then someone who opts out of the normal route of progression and becomes a specialized person in one field so yes if you think that ipr is one field where you can um 
have a lot of cases and get briefed by a lot of cases, then you can opt for that. But I don't see a lot of people doing specialized IP councils. There are not even senior councils. Like I know my mentor, uh, Mr. Chandralal has become a senior counsel and he's someone who's extremely dedicated to the field of IP. But I don't recall of many lawyers who are only dedicated themselves, uh, who've only dedicated themselves to the field of IP. But that's purely my lack of knowledge. I don't think so. Uh, so what task constitutes the major work of IP lawyers? Also, it would be great if you can now also tell us some legal documents IP lawyers have to draft very frequently so that our learnings can get more articulated. Okay, I, I will I will tell you something which is very peculiar to the field of uh, IPR. I understand that, you know, as litigating lawyers, or even uh, in terms of uh, corporate compliances, there are deadlines, there are statutory compliances that are required to be done. But, you know, when I when I look at the IP field in at greater depth. I see the deadlines and time management plays an extremely crucial role because there is a procedure. IP is a, uh, the, the procedural part of IP is very technical and very deadline based. You file an application, then within a certain time when it gets advertised, people have to raise objections in case they find your mark, what you're trying to register is too similar. If you, if they think that you are, you know, uh, a, if, if they need to file opposition to what you're trying to register, then you have to file your replies within a particular time. The, you know, when you, even when you get a mark register, or if you get your intellectual property registered, that right is not infinite. It's granted for a finite period of time. Then you have to file renewals for it. If you have to assign your right to somebody, let's say you are a registered uh, IP rights holder, but you have to re assign it in favor of someone. There's a procedure and timeline for that. So one thing that I observe and which every lawyer has to be cognizant of in terms of, especially if they want to make a career in the field of IP is a very good deadline or timeline management. Now, a lot of law firms have sophisticated software to do this. They have, they spend um, most of the IP firms invest heavily in software because that's how the functioning of the firm functions. Let's say if you have a huge portfolio of something like a, a Coca-Cola or a, a Cadbury or um, any uh, FMCG, like, like let's say Marico, they have huge trademarks. Do you know every time they conceptualize uh, a new product before that, before the even the product gets conceptualized and reaches the production stage, a lot of IP needs to get protected. A lot of names have to get protected. So they file trademark um, applications much ahead in time. So a lot of your game when you want to make a field in IPR will be how efficient you are in terms of managing the timelines and deadlines. If you are managing a portfolio of trademarks, which is like uh, running into perhaps thousands, the Mark Cadbury or the Mark Coca-Cola has evolved over a period of several years. The way they write their C, the way there is an arc under the C, the way uh, there is a size, the way font has to come, or the way alignment of the mark has to come. So it evolves and every time it in, evolves, there is a, a protection which needs to be sought from the registry. So if you are able to multitask in terms of my, uh, managing the timelines, giving substantive advice, if you have an eye for detail, these are the desired uh, qualities I would look for in an IP lawyer. And of course, if you mentioned that uh, what kind of documents uh, IP lawyers have to draft. So if your, your first step is the search, when you have to advise the client, if they want to file a mark or if they want to file, uh, if, what, if they're seeking protection of their, their IP rights, the first step, whether it's patents or trademarks is to search what has already been registered, what has already been done. If you know that patent is granted with respect to an invention, if you, if there is something that has already been invented, so you have to be very sharp in terms of your search. You have to be very sharp with your search skills, not only the search skills, after searching, let's say you find that there are 10 or 15 other similar kind of trademarks that have already been registered. Then you have to be also be able to advise the client that why their mark can or cannot be registered. Let's say there is a word which I really like and I want my product to be named on that product. How as a lawyer, you can convince me to let go of that name because there is already a lot of other such similar names if I'm too attached to it. So you have to have excellent skills in terms of searching, search advising, telling the clients about their entire brand strategy. If you're, uh, if, if you're also 
going to be working on the contentious side, which is like uh, challenging somebody, or let's say somebody is using a similar mark, or you've registered a mark, your client has registered a mark, but someone is producing fake goods with those marks, or using uh, a, a counterfeit, creating a counterfeit product, then you, know, you need to have the ability to draft notices. They are called cease and desist notices, in which you give warnings to people to stop using the marks. You should also have the ability to, um, if, if you are going on the more contentious side, then of course, drafting suits, all of that forms a part of IP. So there is a prosecution angle to it. And then there is an enforcement angle to it. Okay. okay. So uh, uh, I would like to emphasize a bit more on the kind of work they do, like what statutes do they need to have in the back of their mind for compliance work, for due diligence work, et cetera, et cetera. If you can, um, in light, if you can enlighten us a bit more on that part, it would be great. Anubha, definitely all the bear acts, uh, if you are in that particular area, if you trademarks, kar rahe ho to, trademarks act and trademark rules, if you copyright, kar rahe ho to, copyright ke liye karoge. design, ke apne acts hai, pattern, ke apne act hai. bear acts is something that is completely, uh, I would not say you have to buy heart it, but you have to be able to interpret it in a way that protects the interest of your uh, client. Of course, agreements and contracts become the basis of most of the jurisprudence, most of the evolution of laws. But if, I'm, if you're talking to me purely on the IPR side, I'm going to say the bear acts. If you are also going to be asking me about media, because I did get some queries yesterday after you posted uh, about the session and people did uh, request me if I could touch upon the media part as well. So if you're talking about media, then of course, uh, again, copyright becomes a lot, uh, something that you need to be completely aware of and co the contracts part. This, these two, I think are, are, are very, very relevant apart from all the bear acts. Bear acts, you have to be very, very thorough with. Okay. So sir, uh, you have worked with hundreds and hundreds of IPR law firms in your career. You have, you have also done some major hiring for many high designation of tier one law firms. So you have managing partners, presidents, directors of top notch organizations as your buddies. So what are the skills you desire in a potential hire or for IPR team? Also, what are the, um, what are the performance expectations from an associate? for a promotion or a referral or for a golden recommendation from Nipun Bhatia. <laughs> okay. I, uh, I would, I would, I would categorize this uh, in a couple of ways. Of course, yeah. see, if you are talking about at the fresher level or at the level where you are entering into the profession, you have just entered in the profession. I, I do not expect a lot of practical wisdom from you at that time. All what I need is how, strong you are in terms of what you have academically studied. But at the same time, what differentiates from um, a, a, a star performer to any, any other normal performer. And this is something that I've gone on record and told people a few hundred times is how passionate you are about your field and how you are keeping your finger on the pulse. I read, uh, um, I read uh, an article a couple of days back because I also follow music, I follow movies, just out of plain interest and of course because it's, it's intertwined in all of that. But I, am, I don't follow that only from the perspective of gossip. So there is this new single, new song that has been released by this rapper called uh, Bacha. And this is, it's, uh, they've tweaked a, a Bengali folk song and they've now remixed and wrapped into it. Now there's a lot of controversy surrounding that song because uh, people are saying that it's a folk song. They have not given credit to the person who wrote the song. And uh, Bachag is giving that defense that, you know, it's a folk song. Everybody has a right on folk song. It's something that's in public domain. Uh, there is no one creator or one writer of a folk song. It is sung in the, uh, it, it's, it's the music and the song of the soil. So not one person can claim right on it. And what I have done is perhaps just remixed it and given it my own authentic version. So, you know, one part of it is reading this part as a news. I also, when I read about it and also to refresh my own knowledge about the subject, I went on to see what folks, what, uh, what are the rights on folk songs? How can one claim right on folk songs? Because of my interest on the copyright side. 
and there were certain interesting cases that have happened in the past as well when people were trying to claim copyright on a folk song and the court denied it saying that it's you know it's it's in the public domain everybody you no one person can claim right on a folk on a folk song or a folk music so why i'm quoting this example is if you want to impress me in an interview where i'm hiring you i need to see how have you gone the extra mile to keep yourself updated than of another colleague who cv might be you know sitting right next to you if both of you have come with similar sort of marks if both of you have come with similar sort of internships what is going to be that distinguishing factor the distinguishing factor is how aware are you about the commercial aspects have you done any papers have you written any articles have you done any sort of research and thought papers so stuff like this if i need to hire someone i am looking for a flair and this is when i'm speaking to partners from top ip firms and i when they reach out to me that you know i'm i'm looking for a potential hire so a couple of times i also you know prod it further and i was like what is it that you're looking for you know these couple of cvs that i've shared with you um these are really good cvs so they are like you know what they are good academically i see a lot of marks but when i talk to them in the interview there is no flair for the field there is no uh, that that twinkle in the eye when they're talking about ip because uh, you have studied it academically but what is the practical implication of it in daily life if you are going for an interview and you know at least four five recent developments that have ha- had in the field what acts have been revised what is the implicant implicate implication of those revisions what celebrated cases have come about if you are not aware of this how do you expect to impress someone in an interview nobody is only going to ask you tell me this section tell me what does this section says because in we are we are equipped with resources in today's uh, times we can refer to libraries we can go online and search you know through search engines i need to know how much of that learning or that resource which is available how much of it have you Im- imbibed in a practical life that is what makes a difference for me Great answer, sir. So, okay. Now the question which comes in my mind is, uh, we know that uh, IPR law has various. It's a multifaceted law. You have all yourself said that th- it is very broad. Like we know that IPR has uh, media and entertainment, pharmaceutical, fashion, arts law, trademark law, patent law, copyright laws, etc. So. so how these areas are different from one another in the terms of kind of work involved and the kind of repertoire involved in kind of repertoire required to get that work done and the second one would be what kind of background helps in succeeding in ipr law absolutely relevant so um you know let's let's say that you want you are more interested in the patent side yeah. because there is inventions involved there is a prior art search but i personally again it's my opinion and i don't want to vouch for it as an industry opinion but patent is very technical if you are not from science background or if you are not uh, from those particular patent also has sub fields by the way again so, so some things which not many people are aware of so there is there is bio there is biopharma there is uh, then you know the whole it angle to it then there is mechanical so within patent there is a lot that needs to be captured if you are not a science graduate or if you're not somebody who's had a little bit of specialization in the field of science patent is a difficult field for you designs could be slightly difficult though not as difficult as patents but designs could also be difficult if you if you're not coming from a science background trademarks is relatively easier but it's not that that the nuance is completely different the nuance is that in trademarks your your area of thinking is much broader because you're advising somebody on the entire branding what is a trademark it distinguishes your goods from another good from another person's goods or services in the market so you need to have very sharp a uh, brain in terms of strategy in terms of what sells in terms of what can protect your client in terms of how to um, challenge if someone's uh, misusing the kind of mark that you've already done what grounds can you raise what grounds can you not raise 
uh, you know, can you be successful in still getting a descriptive mark registered? Whereas the act clearly says that your marks cannot be descriptive. But if there are descriptive marks, how have you succeeded? Can you explain prior use? Can you explain that the person has already been using it for quite some time? So the kind of strategy you take in trademarks is very different in comparison to patents, which is much more technical, science driven, uh, a lot again on um, if, if something has been invented in the past already and you just do one value add, which changes the entire uh, theory, which changes the entire uh, prior uh, something which has already been registered then what is that inventive step you've built on from the from your prior art and how can you get it registered? So the kind of application of mind is very different in comparison to something which is, let's say, a geographical indication, which is much simpler, but you need to still understand what qualifies to be registered as geogra geographical indication. How can you justify that what is being produced in a particular area only belongs to that area? Nobody else can produce it from that area. There is a special uh, requirement which is only uh, restricted to a particular geography. So the kind of application of mind for each of these subfields is very different. Even within trademarks and patents, as I previously mentioned, there is a prosecution angle to it, which is basically filing your application, ensuring it gets listed, it gets your mark gets registered. That is one aspect which is procedural. And there is another aspect which is contentious. Uh, which will involve criminal angle sometime if if somebody is kind of uh, you know misusing your trademark you have to also you you take permission from court you do criminal raids you also uh, file suits against them so within each subfield there is also the difference between the prosecution work and the contentious work which people need to be aware of as far as a repertoire you mentioned if you have some sort of um, I would say, you know, uh, your right internships, I'm talking from the job perspective. If you are a science person and you've pursued your internships in the relevant fields for patents, of course, you become a right mix for me to look into as a prospective hire. If, it, if you're talking about copyrights, I would want to see what your understanding of not just the act is, how practically you are aware. Are you aware of the procedures of how a registry functions? When do you have to get your copyright registered? What protection is available? What protection is available under the common law? What protection is available under the statutes? So all of this does, you have to be thorough in what particular field you choose, even within IT. Of course, sorry, I, I, you would also mention about sports law and fashion law. And I see some comments uh, also with respect to that. So. Sports and fashion is something that has come up big way in last decade. It wasn't, you know, people were seeking still protection under the common uh, procedures, but it has come up in a big way because the competition has increased. There are chances and there are cases where people feel that their designs have been uplifted or, you know, the, the when you when you talk about sports law again there, there, there is sports law as such it's governed a lot by contracts it's governed by what royalties one has to claim what uh, endorsements one has to do so people who have an interest in specific fields like let's say fashion law let's say sports law first of all i'm sorry if i'm sounding a little rude i i uh, tender my apologies uh, much in advance but do not run after a field just because you think it's glamorous. Some people feel media law is glamorous. Sports law, because everybody is talking about sports law. Oh, man, I'm doing sports law or I want to be interested in fashion law. Understand the deeper realms of it. When I spoke about when I took a session, I think I, I do remember we, we did a session uh, on media law specifically at the law. Yeah, Office. yeah. There also I said that people think that media law is very glamorous under that gla glamour. There is a lot of contractual work that goes. You have to, if you, if you take up one movie production, there are maybe a hundred contracts and agreements within that production. You have to have an agreement with the actors, the cast and crew, the people who are going to be serving you. Then of course, what rights you have to give, uh, what are the production and distribution agreements? And those agreements may look quite similar. And the, those agreements may look a lot in bulk. But each of them may have very one particular little nuance, which you cannot afford to miss. If you're talking about media litigation and all of these fancy uh, uh, 
uh, news reports which we read that you know uh, this movie is now they are seeking an injunction not to release this but understand the level of hard work that goes behind it because you have to not only be very very strong procedurally if my movie is supposed to release in next two days or one day and somebody is seeking an injunction in the release i may run into huge losses so my team of lawyers may have to sit the entire day and entire night to ensure that my right is protected so there is a lot of hard work that goes into it so if you are choosing a field beat media beat sports beat fashion first understand what laws are applicable and i see some questions where people are saying uh, tell us what laws are applicable there is no if you if you want to go and see a bear act fashion law of india there is no bear act as such when i'm talking about fashion law when i'm talking about sports when i'm talking about uh, media you have to understand that they they work a lot they draw a lot of their features from contract act copyright act you need to be aware and thorough in your research go online there is plenty of research material available if you are get into the habit of reading news and when you reading news don't read news as a person who is interested in just reading up about it that's how i do it when i read a news piece and which is interesting like i mentioned yesterday's incident about that song i actually went on to uh, look on the copyright what has what cases have happened in the past not because i have a test tomorrow or i have an interview tomorrow just because i need to be aware what's happening in the field that i am in, interested in so get into the habit of tracking what's happening in the field but also if you can look for spare 10 15 20 minutes half an hour seeing a judgment read the judgment try and find out go to the particular court's website or any other online link find judgment and read the nuances of a judgment that is going to equip you with how judges have interpreted how every act is challenged or you know uh, not challenged which part of it is considered by the court and when the those judgments are pronounced they refer to a lot of previous cases they refer to a lot of commentaries they uh, refer to a lot of parliament debates or so when the law was enacted what was the purpose behind it the what that can equip you nothing else can so get into the habit of a reading the news but backlinking the news to the judgments and the orders extremely important right great answer sir uh, so after hiring hundreds and hundreds of lawyers after working on the best balls on the walls ip law firms uh, what are the workplace challenges for young lawyers in the initial years of their careers uh, also as per your experience uh, though i have uh, uh, we have talked enough about it but still as it is so important i didn't think i don't think one would mind we doing it one more time uh, what as per your experience what are the skills young lawyers are lacking not the skills required but what the skills you find they are really lacking which hinders their professional growth okay so which part do you want me to answer first the latter uh, workplace challenges first workplace challenges first workplace challenges is the your ability to adapt and also the maturity of understanding that it's not college anymore it is something which is much more serious and one small mistake can perhaps compromise a client's interest and you may not always have a second chance so while i don't mean to scare you by any uh, means i would want to point out over here is that if you are talking really about a workplace challenge the biggest workplace challenge that you will face is your own lack of adapting to the work environment a lot of us react first and understand the implications of it later when we are starting our journey as lawyers the ego has to be kept aside when i deal with a lot of young lawyers i feel they in you know um, they they need to uh, they jump to the conclusions fast they want to speak before they hear and it's believe you me it's not considered as a very good trait at the same time i've been interacting and you all of you know right now by now that i uh, we, uh, i perhaps connect more with uh, lawyers much younger than my age 
and i'd like to believe that that that's happened so far so uh, i can connect with age group of uh, you know people who are much younger to me but the only one point i feel they are lacking you guys all of you are extremely sharp the kind of training you guys are getting in your law law school we didn't get in hours we were also very academic at least your law schools push you for a lot of practical work you guys are very aware of your internships i hardly did one or two internships and i regret not doing at that time because it could have given given me a lot many exposure and you know the first year when i worked as uh, the finance person if i had done my internships well perhaps i would have utilized that one year also in doing a lot of law related work so utilizing your internships definitely is one part of it all of you guys are very equipped you guys are sharp but the skills that you need to function and if you want to fit in a workplace always first few months observe not speak in terms of opinion yes if you have a legal opinion if you have a point to put forth gauge what the right forum is some of your partners are very welcoming they would really want you to share your views some partners may not want you to do that in an open forum but more on a one on one basis you definitely if if at all if a firm gives you exposure to deal with a client or be present in a client meeting you are not supposed to speak because you know the firm has had a client relationship for several years you are just someone who has joined the team very very recently so in front of client what to speak what not to speak especially that can agitate them or which can scare them or which can give them false hope of winning or losing a case or a matter or a filing or an application that those things need to be very very uh, uh, handled very carefully so first desired skill and when you if you want to excel in a workplace is observe see what the working style of your senior is it is extremely important because a lot of times you may feel your art of writing email is extremely good you may feel you have sent uh, an attachment by an email your senior may want to look it in in the body of the email so observe the way your senior is drafting observe your the way your senior is writing emails follow the routine follow what uh, gives comfort to your seniors and your working environment i think the first few months you need to definitely at whatever workplace you go be ready for the working hours no lawyer at least that i would like to believe in that practice that nobody wants to just make you sit for the heck of it there is work and sometimes it's just an etiquette people feel that you know if my senior is sitting i cannot leave but all those are presumptions that we build in our head understand the art of transparent communication but do not sound overconfident or cocky or somebody who is you know uh, i am mr know it all it can it cannot be from that perspective it definitely has to be from the perspective that you are there to learn first few months observe if you are giving if you are given a work i i cannot emphasize on this enough guys please seek a timeline do not assume ki aaj kaam mila hai to mujhe agle ghante mein karke dena hai ya mujhe ye kal tak karna hai ya mujhe week ke end tak karna hai you always seek timeline from your senior when you start working on something if it thinks you if you think it's going to take you 4 5 6 hours aur aap 4 5 ghante ke baad ja ke kisi senior ko kaam dikhaoge and the senior says no this is not what i asked you to do or you know you are not supposed to research on this topic or it's not what i had asked you to do so when you get work always prepare an outline in your head if you want to write the brief pointers write those pointers down and tell your senior that i am thinking of approaching this in this way and you have allocated me these four areas of work oh, can you help me prioritize this i think i should do this first followed by this then this and then this so what happens is you are buying uh your seniors constant in the way you are approaching your deliverables in case your senior says listen i am not going to prioritize it for you tum khud kar lo to tumko samajh mein aa jayega first few interaction se that your senior wants you to take that call yourself they don't want you to fall back on them so be observant if you are observing all of these things you will imbibe this most importantly when you are sending something to your seniors and when you prepare a draft or an email and 
your senior makes changes to it and sends it to the client and you are marked a copy of that on the email. Get into the habit of reading the changes that were made. Get into the habit of observing what value additions somebody who's working with you has done. Because the next time you should not be repeating the same thing. The next time you should not be repeating the similar changes. So workplace challenges are when we don't prepared or we don't hygiene factors. जब हम कॉलेज जब हम कॉलेज से निकल गए हैं देन आवर अप्रोच हैज टू बी अ लॉट प्रोफेशनल एज एन इंटर्न इफ यू डू नॉट कम टू ऑफिस एंड यू इन्फॉर्म मी बाय 11 ओक्लॉक और 12 नून इन द इन द डे आई मे स्टिल कंडोन इट इट्स फाइन यू आर स्टिल जस्ट एन इंटर्न दो सम फर्म्स डू नॉट डू दैट बट एज अ लॉयर एंड व्हेन समवन इज काउंटिंग यू एज अ पार्ट ऑफ द टीम इफ यू आर इन्फॉर्मिंग मी एट 12 noon that you know i won't be able to make it to the office today my work plan goes completely haywire because i can't uh, i can't fall back on you or trust on you for a deliverable the next time so these are very basic hygiene factors which not lot of people keep in mind hum bimar ho gaye lekin kaise bimar ho gaye ki aap aaj ek din bimar ho kal bhi ko theek ho jaoge so things like these have a transparent communication have your conduct absolutely clean communicate seek timelines always discuss outline and prioritization with your seniors i think if you do certain of these things it's really good of course i'm not talking on the technical side technical side you have to be impeccable in your research don't do a shoddy job of it if you have not applied mind to a uh, document i can make that out in like few seconds not even minutes because if you are if you are sending me a badly formatted document if you have just copy pasted some research done and if i'm prodding you on those research points you cannot answer me on those research points then i of course know that it's just a copy paste job and you have not applied your mind to it so given the luxury of the time if you have please do a good job of any research proposition a senior gives you if you are drafting and if you have access to previous drafts read those drafts always equip yourself with as much knowledge as you can see there is no end to learning it is only you put those limits and ceilings on yourself to me if you ask there is sky is the limit you need to understand what access you have to which resources if you think your seniors are they can give you access to work done by them previously always ask that because that's going to give you a very good first um base of creating something i think that's extremely extremely important Great answer, sir. Sir, so observing, email etiquettes, adapting to the environment, jostling with the working hours, transparent communication, lack of humility, not seeking timelines, and prioritizing the work. These are uh, some of the major workplace challenges IP lawyers face, right? Yes, these are some things. If you do, you will not face too many workplace challenges. Yeah. Ah, uh, so ah, uh, okay. So now you have very well addressed all the queries related to young lawyers. So now move move to the another part of the media law. the facet of career making in media ipr law uh, what is the scope of independent practice in ipr law like is it an area dominated by law firms also can one shift his or her practice in ipr law given that they have required qualifications uh yes they can uh <clears throat> yes it's an area um, dominated uh, by law firms for a couple of reasons a lot of bigger players multinational companies they have huge portfolios as i said they, the their uh, uh, the portfolio of their patent work or trademark work is running into a few hundreds or if not thousands definitely hundreds they look for bandwidth and bandwidth is something that gives comfort to any foreign lawyer any foreign law firm or any multinational companies so it's not some uh, basic uh, little independent practitioner if you know uh tomorrow the circumstances are not that great uh, an individual practitioner may come may tomorrow shut the shop so things like these definitely law firms have an edge because of the fact that there is uh, they have the bandwidth and then their bandwidth is multi layered they have a good uh, layer of junior lawyers who are helping them with procedural stuff and research they have a good bank of paralegals who are very strong on the operational aspects and of course then there are partners 
who lead the show, who deal with foreign lawyers and multinational company um, brand strategists. So, uh, having said that, having said that, I I believe one important uh, thing is that Indian clients, for that matter, are not given as much handholding. Uh, a lot of IP firms, so to say, run after. MNCs and foreign firms because the bulk and the chunk of work comes from there. Indian clients in that bargain sometimes are not preferred by Indian law firms. So Indian small players who may not have a portfolio of trademarks, uh, 100 uh, trademarks to be protected. They may have only 20 trademarks to be protected, but that still is a lot on stake for them. That is where the smaller practitioners come in. So I have a lot of friends who who are uh, you know uh, working and operating with a team of four or five lawyers with with very humble offices but then they are doing some fantastic work because they have a lot of indian clients they are also able to tap a few foreign clients so yes the area definitely is uh, the if you if you talk about top ip firms it's always ip firms not individual ip uh, you know not individual ip of our practitioners but yes when then there is that that middle layer of humble IP practitioners, slightly smaller in size, but doing good amount of work. You, people can shift to IP, people can move to IP, but also keep mindful of the fact it's that that a lot is being automated. Registries that the IP registries are being automated across the world, not just India. So there is this huge question mark that tomorrow is machine or is uh, the automation part going to take away from the lawyers jobs. So not many people are very comfortable taking up prosecution and making it as the mainstay of their practice. But yes, IP uh, strategy, IP litigation is something that no machine can do. Litigation will always be something that's going to be done by lawyers. So yes, I think uh, people can move into IP specialization, but have a good bank of clients to sustain your practice first. If you if you think that you can have that confidence of sustaining the practice with an X number of clients, by all means, go and set up your own practice in IP. Okay, okay. So you just mentioned that you know some people who have done this and they are doing quite well in their life. Uh, so can you, uh, touching upon, mm, let me rephrase it. So can you give us some uh, tips or some uh, advice on how one can start uh, the practice and uh, what these people you know, what they have done great that they are now doing so well. So uh, first, first and foremost, as I said, uh, most of these firms who are working with, let's say only four or five lawyers still doing really good for themselves is they invested heavily into technology. As I said, litigation uh, IP is a lot on deadlines. The entire game is of deadlines. So you will humanly, you cannot keep a track of it. Hum, it, because it's prone to mistake. You can, of course, maintain your timelines in the form of a Excel sheet. Also, people are doing, people have so far done that only, but, uh, everything that you leave to human, um, updation is prone to errors. So people have invested into technology. That is one part that they've, they've, that they've done connecting and making relationships is, is something that is, um, of course, uh, how do I put it? It's the mainstay of every practice, not just IP, but more so in the IP, because if you are tracking what's happening in the industry and you can actually value add to your clients in terms of connecting with them on the business side, on the business plans, on the business strategy. In that case, yes, definitely what you need to do is uh, be more, um, Connect with your clients on the business angle. Connect with your clients on the business side. That's what these people have done. So uh, one of my uh, one of one of my very good friends who kind of built the practice from scratch and today they are doing some fantastic work is they uh, handheld one Indian uh, uh, two Indian startups and today those startups are big names in the field of service and um, in terms of hospitality. Uh, they conceptualize the first name of the brand. And today those brands are uh, in several cities and you know, their presence is across India. So if you connect with startups and if you connect with certain people and help them build their business from scratch, that is where I see a true IP lawyer emerging and setting up their practice because then you are not just assisting clients in filing their trademarks or patents or helping them design something. You're actually 
giving them high end first class business advice that is where you value add for me great great answers nipun sir is so eloquent and so well versed with everything that i am running out of questions here <laughs> I'm sure people have a lot of questions. I did not see the chat window, but I see there's a lot of questions. So yes. Uh, so okay. Um, let me ask you this very interesting question. We know that there are two kind of partners in every law firm. One who serve the clients, we also call them keepers, and the other who bring new, a uh, fresh piece of business. We call them. We also call them rainmakers. Correct. So we discussed enough on how to be a keeper. We have discussed skills. We have discussed we have challenges. So now, can you give us? Give our attendees some tips on how to be a rainmaker. How bring more clients as an IP lawyer. The the good part of that commercial sense or that economics. In, interestingly, I was writing an article on this yesterday. That if you actually want to build business, or if you actually want to do do rainmaking, stop doing rainmaking. That is the only advice I will give you. The moment you are approaching a client out of a pure business need. or a commercial need clients are not stupid they will definitely get you uh one thing that is rewarding that has rewarded me and i know of several who have worked with me in the field is your art of building relationships so don't always meet people or talk to them or say hello or hi to them when you need them uh, for giving you business or for giving you any uh commercial uh, sense to it you have to genuinely any which way keep a track of meeting and saying hello to people without when you have interest or when you don't have interest speak to them ask their well being ask how their business is doing what are their future plans when you connect with them on a much more macro level and yet when you do that over a period of time it is something that you don't have to do just once or twice you have to have a continued engagement with people when you brainstorm with somebody on their future that's when you can actually come up with certain ideas and those ideas will be genuine those will not only be driven by money of course if if you are very good friend with someone or if you have a very good rapport with someone sometimes we we tell them uh, you know in a very very friendly way ki acha ye kaam aayega to yaar ye kaam humko de do we will do this work but that is someone you have an extreme level of comfort with i'm talking about connecting with people on a much broader level i i personally would not believe in pure cold calling and telling people that give us work i would much rather win them with my expertise i would much rather win them through my capabilities and how will they know of my capability is when i'm speaking to them when they see that i can give them practical value added advice and when they see that i can uh, give them advice on growing their business every client wants to grow their business the moment you have the art of telling your client if you do this your business goes one level higher if you are able to connect with your clients on that level they will keep continuing to engage with you they will keep on consulting you so interestingly the graph of it grows first your clients will start consulting you they may pay you they may not pay you for that second when they are convinced you are consulting they may start giving you a few assignments and if you done if you do well and if you excel in those doing those assignments then is when you you know then you become a source they become a source of repeat work for you and when somebody does a source of repeat work for you then the fourth stage comes in as when they start referring you to other people other clients and uh, other uh, others who may be in need of such law so every relationship has to mandatorily grow go through the, these four stages you have to start uh, becoming their consultant you have to stu- do their test cases you have to win repeat work and after winning repeat work you have to a uh, win their confidence to earn more referrals that is the true art of rain making so phenomenal sir so okay another interesting question we know that media entertainment is one of the biggest branch of ip law and the companies like netflix amazon mx player all balaji z media tvf hotstar etc have started looking extensively for media lawyers so according to you how a non in lu middle class guy like me can make up his way to to these top notch organizations you have to have a lot of commercial and practical understanding of whatever area do you you choose so um, a netflix or a google or uh, an uber tomorrow uh, whatever your wish list of the companies is 
there is no end to reach to that wish list companies if you can show your credentials i have you know gone on record to say this a thousand times now there is no better brand than knowledge if you can showcase what you can bring to the table for me i i your, your chances to get hired by me is 100 times more when i'm talking of uh, netflix how much have you studied netflix's journey in india how have they expanded their roots what ro- regulations are applicable to them are you keeping a track of what other ott platforms are being subjected to are they regulated what kind of agreements are being reached on between um, the service providers and somebody who's availing that service you need to you know how do i say this i can't i can't uh, particularly uh, probably articulate it in in the most perfect way but hum hindi mein bolte hai na ghol ke pee jana hai you have to be so thorough with what's happening in that domain and yes your your work credentials have to show that if you have researched if you have interned if you have studied if you have written about uh, uh, written avidly about a particular industry sector or a particular area that is what should come across in your cv your covering email has to speak about what you have uh, how you have an edge with lot others because you've had a practical side of it for me i am always going to look for that the moment you are giving me a glimpse of your practical journey that i will perhaps weigh a little more than your educational journey of course your college matters a lot your grades your marks matter a lot but you can always cover up you can always make up for it through the practical experience and this is also one question somebody asked me on linkedin that if i don't have good grades if i'm not from the topmost college how do i make up for it and i gave this exact answer that you can make up for it through your practical exposure you can make up for it from uh, you know you, you have to perhaps uh, tell your prospective employer how is it that you are um, practically equipped with more pragmatic or commercial sense of a particular field or a business so academics is one part usme to strong hona hi hai technical law pe to strong hona hi hai so agar agar ek doctor ko surgery karne ka basics nahi pata honge to koi usse surgery karwayega nahi but phir ek wo bhi hai ki us doctor ne kitni critical surgeries kari hain to dono parts hain technical side hona bahut zaruri hai lekin us pe practical tum kitna build kar sakte ho wo adds a lot value to it sir can you tell us a few stories around it like you you have teams of lawyers people have team of lawyers you have teams of lawyers under you so can you tell us uh, a few stories around how you have seen people making uh, setting really good examples of advices you have just given to us and uh, sometimes when these have gone wrong so um, okay uh, if you are asking me of uh, the so, practical stories uh, practical stories with respect to uh, with respect to what the business development or team or ip uh, if you could give me like what what exactly what kind of uh, practical uh, example you're looking at uh like a young lawyer really making his way up to, uh, to his, in front of partners making a reputation for himself uh, by okay. following these advices okay yeah. so so yes okay good example uh, good good question uh somebody who was interning so i'll give you two examples one of my my very good friends uh, nishant he is now the founder of um, uh, an organization called pact which is called the peacekeeping and conflict resolution team and he does a lot of mediation related trainings across law schools in india a fantastic person and you know i'd seen him when he was perhaps in his second year he had interned under me a couple of times and from that i saw his passion for mediation and uh, you know the adr related field so from a student to today teaching many students the art of mediation the way he has come up is an example for me today he is uh, on his panel of giving trainings there are topmost partners from uh, shardul amarsh and mangal jas and luthra and luthra coming and giving those trainings because the platform which he established was one of its kind they only do mediation trainings throughout the india they also did you know a couple of uh, first few initial trainings uh which were held in goa for a or for a three or four day retreat where people were taking training at a much more chilled out environment than making it very formal so the kind of vision that person had for a field and that story for me 
is a success story because uh, I saw Nishant studying that whole confusion every student goes through that whether I should do litigation or corporate or ADR or arbitration, taking that call of specializing and you know going into the niche of mediation to today founder of an organization that is conducting training throughout the uh, throughout India. And I have taken sessions on those uh, trainings. So from someone who's interned under me today to today, someone who's calling me to take sessions, the relationship and you know, I see that success story, it's, it touched me uh, a lot. And you know, I, I have tremendous respect for Nishant. Similarly, another another good friend of mine who had interned under me, uh, and I saw the personality and you know, very uh, somebody who's extremely outgoing asking for work, then called me to uh, for a, a college related initiative later on. And when I met that person again in college, I saw that person very good in the research skill, leadership skill, organizing everything. So, you know, luckily uh, the managing partner of one of the top most litigation firms of the country asked me that, you know, they are looking for a research person and also someone who has a personality to deal with the partners across the firm. And that person's name came to my head. And today that, that person is personal knowledge resource to the managing partner of the topmost litigation firm fresh out of college. That person has not even come out of the college as yet still going to come out of the college, but working with exclusively the managing partner as a knowledge resource. So take your internships seriously, you know, gather relationships from the word go because you do not know when that opportunity might come striking. Okay, sir. So, uh, what question I can ask now? Huh? What changes do you okay. anticipate in the Perhaps nearby? Some time to people also to ask questions. Otherwise, uh, we'll out of time. One last, one last question. Just one last. So, uh, what changes do you anticipate in the nearby future in the IPR industry, especially after the coronavirus pandemic? Also, how we people from the legal fraternity can make the best of this opportunity of lockdown to become more valuable as a professional. But before you answer that question, I would like to mention that I'm not asking about skills only uh, because uh, being valuable as a professional also includes building a profile, increasing your online presence, networking, value generation, as you have mentioned hundreds of times. So yeah, this is the question. What was the first question? Uh, the first question was, what changes do you anticipate in the nearby future in the IPR industry, especially after this coronavirus pandemic? So we have to understand that IP as a field and for that matter, any service industry is also a lot dependent on the economic activity. If the manufacturing or the production or the business plans right now are uh, observing a slack, then if I, if my production is not happening, if my manufacturing is not happening, if I'm not building and growing my business because uh, most the, across the globe is facing a shutdown, then I'm not going to be uh, what I'm uh, not going to be filing uh, for new trademarks. So the business side of it will definitely get affected. As far as the practical side with respect to, let's say <coughs> the medical field, the vaccines, uh, the research to how to combat this research, how to prevent this is on uh, a roll right now. So that might see, seek protection tomorrow. If I find a vaccine or if I find a cure for this, which uh, helps me take uh, control of the situation and I need to protect it by way of patents, then what is the public use? Can government force me to release that, that, that patent is going to, is going to compensate me. So one side of it may be thriving, which is related to the medical side of it. But the other side, which is much more business driven, let's say industrial designs, the trademark part is going to be a little low for the time being because there's not much economic activity happening. Yes, trademarks also related to pharma and medical will move, will may perhaps see a surge, but not the business side of it for sure. Um, with movements being restricted, no production happening, um, you know, there is a, a standstill everywhere. I don't see other fields coming up in a big way, let's say a copyright or something, but I do feel that patents will still be growing. So lawyers with uh, more focus on the patent side, perhaps may fee, you know, experience slightly more business than the other ones. Okay. So with this, I'm opening the forum for attendees to ask the questions. People just give me a minute. Now you guys can unmute yourself.
So now Nipun sir is all yours. Hello, hi sir. Hello, hi. This is Maulik. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Hello. Hi, Maulik. Hi, hi, Nipun sir. Uh, I just want you to highlight uh, for IPR lawyer who wish to uh, go to overseas and build their career. As I have been practicing as an IPR lawyer more than three years, so what would be the chances and what would be the things that I need to consider consider before I think for the overseas working? Okay, so again, most of the IP firms across the globe function in a similar manner, but they have their systems are much more sophisticated. Uh, the kind of software and everything we are using here. they are using perhaps much more sophisticated version of it so slight uh, twist with technology is definitely i feel uh, one needs to be uh, up- upgrading themselves with and of course if you are i don't know if you're already uh, you, you you do hold a masters degree but uh, if you want to shift your base uh, abroad so certain of those firms may insist you to have a particular masters degree which is more akin to their laws as well so you need to do a little bit of research on that but uh, off hand these two things come to my mind if you're already not a masters uh, uh, graduate and if you do not hold a specialization in ipr especially with respect to something that the country may have in particular uh, you know it it may enhance your chances if you go and uh, pursue that i don't know what your plans for the future are though hi nipun ji anurag this side hi anurag i just uh, wanted to ask one question if somebody has been into conventional litigation practice for last 8 years okay. and wants to make a shift to the ipr industry hmm. what do you suggest for that person to do uh, i would suggest a slow transition because um, as i said ip prosecution is slightly more technical in terms of being aware of the acts and the deadlines and everything what you can start is because you already have a strong foothold in litigation so you may start taking up ip litigation related cases more build more on the ip litigation side and while you are building that utilize that time to study and you know get more well versed with the procedural aspect of it maybe hire someone who is slightly more junior uh, who is good with the prosecution vertical and then eventually draw uh, strength from each other if you get one more team member who can uh, be strong on the procedural side of it that may also help you build uh, on the enforcement side of it as i said there is an enforcement angle to ip there is sending of notices there is sending of uh, you know uh, warnings to people as to stop using their brands and stuff like that so venture into ip litigation which could be slightly more of a comfort zone and slowly then from ip litigation build another vertical which could be your ip prosecution vertical but but do get someone who's slightly more trained on the prosecution side i think that's going to help you Hi Nipun, uh, thank you so much for the wonderful webinar. I have a, a similar kind of a qualification. I am also CA and LLB. So I have a very interrelated kind of questions. One is that if uh, like I, could I go into the IPR and especially relating to some media or the sports, or would it be difficult for me? I do a lot of NCLT and commercial court matters as of now, and. if there is any kind of a platform where we can have a domain knowledge of some specific sectors which is perhaps construction industry or hospitality for the ipr related field yeah. okay as far as making a shift completely to the media side i uh, it's not that individual lawyers are not doing it they have done it but you see the comfort that's coming from someone who has been in the field let's say uh if i am an actor or a producer or a director or a production house or a talent management agency i need to um, park my issues on someone who is a already has a lot of work experience in that particular area and also as i said bandwidth plays an important role so if i need to do something overnight uh, a bigger firm or a bigger setup may be able to put five or 10 lawyers as compared to someone who is an individual so i am not discouraging by any means all i am saying is for every industry or for every practice you need to be more aware of the practical aspect and practical considerations also if i if my rights have to be protected and i do not have too many chances to protect them then i may perhaps go in for a name which may be uh, which which has already done done this kind of work the thing the way out for you if you want to make a foray into the media is 
to first start locally with the local media agencies small firms small production houses and when you are able to build some sort of a work body of work then maybe perhaps you can target the bigger ones and and uh, what is any database for this uh, to leave these kind of domain knowledge for the ipr on any website or anything you deem fit so uh, when you are talking about database that means are you asking about the kind of people who are there or uh, the the knowledge resources the knowledge the knowledge part how to stand in the domain areas of particular industry not really i i again as i said see all of us the the starting line for all of us is the same you would have studied the same ipr or media or copyright in your college days as i would have studied the starting line is same same for everyone where we build on perhaps a more is um, you know the practical aspect of it yes i do understand that there are courses online courses losico definitely is an institution in, in itself in terms of on so if it helps you gain slightly more knowledge into the field why not at least you'll have one one more add on to your profile to to show you uh hello nipun meenakshi here hi meenakshi uh one question from my side is that uh, i have done my post graduation in chemistry okay. and uh, i'm interested in ipr so uh, what job role would suit me and what extra qualification would be required um meenakshi uh, i believe people who are uh, so you are a law graduate or you not a law graduate uh, i i am not a law graduate yes so good um a lot of the work industries that are very heavily patent driven and even law firms hire professionals for writing patents so i think that is one area i see a definitely a value add for you you may join law firms or you may join organizations that are into writing patents because that is going to be a tool you write for someone who has had a, a higher degree in chemistry because that's what is going to help me um, more on the side of uh, the the science uh, aspect of it so that is that is one role i see for you meenakshi okay thank you hello hi this uh, is aisha Okay, hi Aisha. Uh, what do you, what can be the significance of an LLM degree in IPR uh, specialization apart from academics? So, uh, Aisha, I'm sorry, I'm going to be a little honest about this. Uh, you know, it differs from form to form. Some apart from teaching, actually. Yes. So some forms, some forms take IPR, some forms take LLM in a very positive stride. uh because it gives you that added specialized uh, but some firms view it negative because they feel that one year of education more is not equivalent to one year of experience so the practice varies from firm to firm of course if you are asking me as a employer having uh, you know seeing an llm degree on your cv is mm-hmm. the impression that you are definitely you know much more than any other candidate but i if it suggested and which is what i tell people and even when they are doing llm and if you are doing it from abroad try and still have some sort of practical exposure because otherwise the tendency is that people discount one year of your qualification because they will be like are you you were studying only or have much practical exposure okay yeah, for flip side okay thank you side, but depends on form okay. hello okay okay just a minute uh, i have to ask nipun sir whether he can entertain more questions or not so sir uh, what do you say we can take two more questions okay people we are only left with two more chances make the best out of it hello yeah hi prashant hello hello yeah please go on go on hello sachin yeah sachin please go on okay it's okay hello hello you also seems to have a question yeah. please sort of you go on uh nipun sir if i'm audible yeah yeah please shoot shoot yeah sir uh, should freshers directly join tier 1 uh, ipr law firms or should they go for smaller law firms as soon as they graduate uh i'll answer that question quickly in two parts 
not many tier one firms will have dedicated IPR departments, and even if they are, uh, IPR plays just one, you know, one part in the overall scheme. Of I don't, I'm not sure if a lot of IPR tier one firms will give you the experience and taste of first hand dealing with clients. So, what you should do is. try with a more uh, humble organization with a slightly smaller organization because that is going to give you first hand experience of dealing with clients which i believe is a lot more important you don't want to be working only on propositions and researching and then sending it to your seniors if you need to get more practical hands on exposure if you want to learn from paralegals who have been in the industry for several years and they have a lot of operational value to give you i would suggest um, a smaller setup may be a better option for you thank you for saying so thanks a lot one last question one last question yeah sachin yeah. Yes. What uh, aspect of uh, why polo? I mean, why polo training? Expect from uh, a beginner. Can you please repeat your question? Repeat the question. Yes, please. Hello. I'm asking uh, that you should advise your law, young lawyers on the aspect of why polo training that is expected from them. What intellectual property? Hello. Okay. So I have uh, heard that question in part. and i'm going to answer that if i don't know if i've got it correct or not but he's asking about wipo trainings yes wipo does uh, the online uh, courses right. have i got it correct yeah yeah so wipo does a lot of those those trainings and courses online they carry a huge value uh, sorry i did not mention it earlier so you guys can figure out and, uh, and you know they are the authority because uh, wipo is broadly governing the the intellectual property rights and their people looks like he has an internet issue so let me give you his email id so this is the email id of nipun sir and you guys can feel free to reach out to him for all your queries he almost reply to all the emails he get so thank you thank you so much for joining the session it's time for me to bid you adieu uh, also i will be providing you guys with a the feedback message please give your feedback so i can also improve and i can bring more value to you guys thank you so much